So yes, hi. This is already the third talk in the series of critical perspectives on technology. And I'm so happy to see a lot of people again and a lot of people are new. And just a bit to the background of the lecture series, I organized it as part of my project on exceptional norms, marginalized bodies in interaction design. My name is Katha Spiel and I'm a um, Hertha Firmberg postdoctoral scholar at TUV. And there I research marginalized perspectives on technology to inform critical design and engineering. But today you are here to hear from Alex. Alex, um, Alex Ahmed is a postdoc at Carnegie Mellon's Human Computer Interaction Institute and advised by Sarah Fox and Ken Holstein. Guided by feminist and queer theory, her work involves a combination of qualitative and quantitative methods, community-based design, and open source software frameworks. And her research has been supported by the NSF Graduate Research Fellowship, the NIH Ruth L. Kirstein I assume, National Research Service Award, and the CRA NIH Computing Innovation Fellowship. In her spare time, she sings in an a cappella group called the Kinsey Scales, plays guitar and board games, and obsesses about Star Trek. Her presentation is titled Community-Based Design of Open Source Software for Transgender People, as you can see. And during the talk, you can ask questions in the chat window or in like any way Alex tells you to. And afterwards, we will be in a discussion led by Jules Gleason, who is a historian, comedian, and Londoner based in Vienna, whose work has focused on gender history, social philosophy, intersex experiences, and Byzantine masculinity. Jules has, well, Jules has been performed at cultural events and conferences in several country, countries, published in outlets, including Invert Journal, Homin Turn, Viewpoint Magazine, and TSQ, and co-edited the forthcoming anthology, Transgender Marxism, which is coming up in May, 2021. But for now- Whoa, that sounds awesome. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I knew you would be a match made in heaven. <laughs> Okay, I would say, Alex, take it away. Okay, hey everybody. Um, thank you, Kata, for the really kind introduction. I'm really glad to be here. Um, so yeah, uh, like Kata said, I'm going to be presenting some work on the design of open source software for transgender people, um, and this is work that I did uh, during graduate school um, at Northeastern University. So I'm going to begin at a place where I think uh, is an inflection point. Um, and that's that computer science researchers and educators um, are sort of pointing to the overall harms that technologies are uh, causing in society. Um, and that is not just limited to the research space. This is also going into uh, college campuses. So the main, even the mainstream media and the United States has said that the share of, of Americans that think that technology companies have a positive impact on society has dropped. And I think that students are really picking up on something here because they're rejecting the oversteps of the tech industry. And I think that this should point us to an alternative vision for the future for doing computer science, doing design more ethically, more justly than we've done it in the past. And there's no shortage of examples that I could point to here from ever more sophisticated facial recognition software, which is being deployed by law enforcement agencies, despite widespread protests from civil rights groups, AI experts, employees, to algorithmic management by gig economy corporations in which workers around the world are constantly being hooked into performance monitoring tools program to exploit them by maximizing their work, minimizing their pay, to computer science research that completely erases transgender people, which renders our identities, needs, and experiences completely invisible. And I don't bring up all these examples just to point to how bad these individual things are. So the purpose of my critique is to shed light on why things are bad, and through that, examining the larger social issues at play. Across all of the examples that I just showed, we see systematic denials of agency. So people are unable to determine how technology is designed and how it affects their lives. 
So over the course of the talk, I'm going to be emphasizing concepts of power and agency in relation to how technologies are designed. But I'll focus specifically on the needs and experiences of transgender people. So before I go any further, a transgender person, generally speaking, does not identify with the gender they were assigned at birth, whereas a cisgender person does. Um, and to misgender someone means to refer to them uh, in a way that disregards how they view themselves. The goal of my dissertation work was to create a technology for transgender voice training. So I'm gonna take a second to explain what voice training is. How transgender people experience our speaking voices can vary widely. Some choose to or are able to pursue formalized voice training to change the way our voices sound in some way, but others don't do this. Those who do pursue it it could be aiming for a higher or lower pitch or a more consistent or variable pitch, or it could be changing the way one speaking voice resonates, like if it's more chest voice, more head voice, for example. It can be distressing to feel like your voice doesn't properly represent you, or that it opens you up to being identified as transgender when you don't want to be. Um, of course, none of these are universal experiences, but this is an issue that folks can come up against in their day-to-day -day life, regardless of whether they choose to pursue voice training or not. Over half of trans women, about 62% are interested in voice training or have done it. Um, and that's the only data that I've found, but voice training just from anecdotal experience and people I know is practiced by people of all gender identities. Professional therapists and specialists are an option for those who can afford or access them, but there are also a number of online resources such as YouTube, forums, mobile apps that all aim to support trans people in working on their voices. Clinical research on speech therapy for trans people has suggested some relationships between voice, mental health, and identity. So how you perceive yourself and how others perceive you. To unpack this more fully, I wanna bring in the concept of embodiment. The literature here is vast, but one definition was provided by HCI scholar, Paul Dorish, who wrote that embodiment describes our existence in the world, which includes our simultaneous experience of physical and social reality. Embodiment and health are connected. So, we feel that our well-being is secured when we are comfortable in our own skin, so that's our physical reality, but also in our relationships with other people, so that's our social reality. When it comes to actually satisfying these needs, though, we have to think about power. So our intrinsic ability to self-determine our physical and social reality is the power to do something. But power, too, is constrained in the face of subjugation and discrimination if some extrinsic thing is holding power over us. So to put this in like everyday terms, take the simple example of being denied insurance coverage. This happens all the time, especially for trans people. Your ability to obtain some treatment has been superseded by a social institution that says, actually, no, you can't. And there's a wider social context going on here specifically for transgender people. So we've seen what appears to be progress in terms of social acceptance of transgender people. And that could be through maybe movies you've seen, TV shows you watch, fashion, and even academic scholarship. Uh, but as Tourmaline explains in the recent anthology Trapdoor, these doors of acceptance can also be traps. In other words, you can be accepted as a trans person, but typically only if you conform to certain gendered expectations, and that includes voice. So acceptance doesn't just mean like a warm and fuzzy feeling that the general population has in their hearts and minds when they think about a transgender person. It also means improved material conditions. So that means access to resources, healthcare, safety, employment. And, you know, for example, not too long ago, the ability of transgender women to access transition-related care hinged on their perceived feminine appearance, 
whether their doctors thought that they were sufficiently heterosexual, they wanted to date men, um, or even how physically attractive they, they were to, to their doctors. In this project, I sought to combat marginalization and health disparities by democratizing access to voice training resources. At the same time, I sought to address a host of issues and limitations that existing apps have. For example, they're expensive, uh, they are not gender inclusive, and they are not de designed with communities in mind. And I'll show you what that looks like. So I wanna share the results of a survey that I did with um, Professor Anna Hoffman at uh, University of Washington, where we looked at these apps in detail. So this is my favorite part of the talk where we actually have to look at these things. Um, these are images that appear right when users first open the app called Eva, which has two versions, one for transgender women, and that's the version on the left, and one for transgender men, and that's the version on the right. On the F side, you see a thin person who uh, appears to be a, a woman um, who is wearing a white dress, who is gazing wistfully out on a, on a beach. Um, and on the transgender men's app, we see the background as someone wearing a suit, um, a fedora, and, uh, and a golden vest. So, there are some gender stereotypes that are really obviously coming out here, but what's more is that these are white people who have a certain upper class aesthetic going on about them. So like, you know, the woman seems to be on some sort of like beach resort and the man is like dressed very fancily. We also can't see their faces, which I think invites the user to identify with them or as them. We see the harmful tropes about trans people playing out not just in the aesthetics, but also the functionality. So like how the apps actually work. So these are, uh, these are two apps where users can read a passage and then they receive a readout of their voices average pitch in comparison to preset gender categories. So in Voice Up, which is the app pictured on the left, um, the user is presented with a series of percentages that don't have any contextual information attached to them. So while some users might understand this visualization to say that of the time that they were speaking, 70% of the time their speech was in the male range, that's not immediately obvious. And in fact, also this design choice is evoking some harmful tropes about transgender people being partly men, partly fem partly women, partly neutral, whatever that means. Um, and in voice pitch analyzer on, on the, app, the app on the right, ranges are visualized um, not as discrete segments, but as a continuous spectrum. And I think it's not, um, it's not a aberration that this app was made by trans people and it's free and open source. So there's like clearly different design ideologies at play here. That, for example, the design decision to render gender categories as fluid emphasizes that they can be sort of fluid or they can be crossed between, whereas the discrete categories version, clearly that's not the case. And that's extremely harmful. And so the next part of my project tried to engage transgender people directly and ask in um, using qualitative interviews to understand how we think and feel about voice training. So I interviewed 10 transgender people about their experiences with voice and technology, and then cluster these quotes into an affinity diagram to explore major and recurring themes. In the interest of time, I'll just go over a couple of quotes that I think are particularly relevant, um, but feel free to check out the paper for more details. I'll be referring to all the participants using pseudonyms that they've selected for themselves. So my interviews revealed that an overemphasis on vocal analytics may not be useful. 
Instead, the app should re encourage reflection and self-determination. So one solution to that could be, the app could ask the question, what do you want to sound like? And that way, framing it as a question instead of a directive. So Miriam, for example, suggested that the goal of the interaction should be co-constructed between the user and the system. It should be like a dialogue rather than the app telling you what you should be doing. Overall, our design study suggested that a successful voice training system should have some voice recording functionality, summarization of voice data, so a mean and a range, for example, user-defined goal setting, so the user can choose what they, they want their pitch target to be um, that aligns with their own sense of self and what they want. A way for users to reflect back on that data to understand or to determine what they want their goal to be moving forward. And a comparison of their performance or progress over time was a really common um, desire. So I want to share a window into the next part of the project, which was a, an attempt at a community-based design where I attempted to dissolve or at the very least try to minimize artificial barriers between researchers and participants. So I started an online organization which I eventually named Project Spectra. So I began by re recruiting one participant from the interview study that I just described and over time our organization grew to over 30 members. Over time, um, <clears throat> during recruitment, I tried to stress that no participation was required or expected based on their membership in the group. So because people had full control over how much they involved themselves, that varied a lot to occasionally joining group meetings to sustained involvement over the course of several months. The entire length of design process ran about a year and a half. So together we designed and developed a free and open source mobile app in the JavaScript based framework, NativeScript View. Our app features real-time pitch tracking as seen in the screenshot on the left and a visualization that takes into account the user's personal voice goals as seen on the right. We try to not only address limitations in existing apps, but as I will show uh, that process was in many ways fraught and flawed based on the institutional context in which I was working in. That being said, we tried to depart from how interactive systems tend to be made in academic contexts. And that's because we didn't just source our design requirements from some separated community. We also were the community we together created this app collectively. Early on, we recognized though that our perspectives were limited. We were all either me members of the trans community or um, the LGBT community more broadly. Um, however, we wanted the app to be useful to all people or as many people as we possibly could, not just ourselves. So we attempted to address this by creating user tests on Google Forms, which we distributed widely through social media and our own personal networks. We gathered 20 responses to our first user test, and we asked users open-ended questions, or testers, not users, open-ended questions, and invited them to freely share their thoughts with us. We then synthesized general trends from the response data, which we used to iterate and define our future mockups. So in addition to using these sort of established design methods like sketching and prototyping and user testing, we also use a number of online collaborative tools. And that's um, important to note because this project was completely online. We met online, we had meetings online, mostly just over text chat, um, but occasionally over video chat. And the online tools we used were for flow charting. So that's um, the screenshot on the right. 
um, and also hand-drawn sketches, which we scanned in and, and shared with the group. One of our members had the idea to formalize our intentions for the design in the form of experience goals. So that person led an exercise where we collectively determined that our app should have three major goals. The first being affirmation. So that's the purple uh, shape in the flowchart. Playfulness, which is the orange one, and then care, which is in blue. So if you look at the flowchart, we try to color code each component of the app to show that our goals were being carried through throughout the design. And so just to show you a little more detail what how those goals were instantiated. So um, affirmation meant that users should feel supported and represented and feel that their choices and identities were respected by the app. So users can personalize the app by entering their name and also their specific goals for voice training and also to change those goals at any time. So you can go back to the screen to like change all of this information, including your name. And we felt that was important to allow people a kind of like fluidity or like, um, you know, flexibility in how and what they were going for. Through our interviews and just personal experiences, we noted that trans people would work their voices sometimes so hard that they would be strained and sore for days afterwards. So an important experience goal therefore was care. And that meant that users shouldn't feel strained or overworked or overwhelmed because there's enough of that in daily life. Instead, the app should project a sense of clarity and restfulness and trust. So we developed this screen which presents vocal health tips during the onboarding section of the app. And vocal health became a focal point rather than are you being sufficiently female? Are you being sufficiently male, for example? And that looked something like this. So we implemented some vocal strengthening exercises, which um, we drew from the speech therapy side of things, um, where speech therapists would work with uh, their clients to uh, strengthen the voice, the vocal cords, such that regardless of what their goals are, um, their voice could be a little bit more strengthened to prevent strain, for example. So we're not assuming any kind of fixed destination here. When we, uh, when we instruct users to hold a particular note, that note isn't fixed. Users can actually choose between a set of whichever one is most comfortable for them to hold. It doesn't actually matter in terms of the strengthening aspect what note that is. And something we've alluded to also is that voice training can be extremely stressful for so many reasons. So we wanted to counteract that by making the app as fun as we possibly could. And therefore our last goal was playfulness. And that meant that the app should be welcoming and encouraging to users without seeming condescending or childish. And this was like a really tough line to, to, uh, to ride because like sometimes we, you know, in trying to make something fun, like, you know, we endeavor towards making this cartoon character. And while, while some people thought it was fun, some people also thought it was childish. So we sort of had to like, make compromises. This conversation practice exercise is our take on the apps that I just showed, I showed you earlier on in the talk, where you sp speak for a while and the app will listen and present you a readout with your pitch in comparison to so-called normative gender ranges. And so uh, we were inspired by Voice Pitch Analyzer, which is the open source app um, that you see on the left uh, with the purple ranges. But we also wanted to implement some improvements over that. So critically, um, we wanted to allow users to see their goal 
uh, on the visualization. In addition, we wanted to emphasize care affirmation and user control and accessibility. So we put in text-based feedback in addition to the visualization. We also wanted to shift our language, not to say to the user whether they're being sufficiently male or female, we're gonna instead say, center the user's own choices. So instead of saying, you were very close to your goal, uh, you met your goal, So all that is to say, we created something and we came in with a set of principles and intentions. And I showed you what those were, playfulness, affirmation, and care. We tried to bear these out throughout the design and, and implementation of the app. But it would be a little too easy for me to end the story here. And it wouldn't also be the entire truth. So our process actually wasn't perfect. I personally encountered challenges involving my own role within the team. And as we reflect in a paper that I wrote with other members of the team, these challenges were both emotional and ethical. So I found myself playing the role of a supporter and a facilitator, in addition to a programmer and designer. Therefore, I sort of became a de facto leader despite my intention for the group to not be hierarchical. I also noticed that my academic position strongly influenced the direction of the work. For example, because I was under deadlines to finish my dissertation, I found myself stifling the unique ideas of others who wanted to create new and different apps rather than focus on the one I just showed you. So I have a distinct memory of uh, texting with uh, other members of the team on our Discord channel um, in the middle of the night because we were in all sorts of different time zones. And someone brought forth a, you know, an idea and a criticism of the app that I just showed you, sort of saying that, no, this doesn't solve the problem. Like there needs to be more of a pedagogical focus where we sort of go through with a curriculum and we have users go through that. And I kind of reacted with some defensiveness. I was like, hey, I mean, like, you know, we worked really hard on this. Like, you know, do you think, you know, is there a way to combine your ideas into the existing app? Is there, you know, is there a way to, to address your concern in the existing design? And this person just pretty much straight up said like, no, I think the existing design is bad. And I have to say, I mean, this person had a lot of knowledge about voice training, had, um, sort of independently of the speech therapy, like monolith of academic knowledge, um, was creating their own curriculum um, and wanted to incorporate that into an app form. And my def defensive response, I, I grew to regret a lot. I, um, throughout the project, um, I wrote about my regret and I wrote about how I had felt um, a little, yeah, offended and defensive that, that this person um, wanted to take off in a different direction. But then on reflection, I was like, wait, like, why am I? You know, and what is it about my institutional context and in my, in the context that I was bringing in to the some need, but, but yeah, it, um, it made me reflect on this. And that sort of helped me form my argument that I think community-based design processes should be disconnected from academia to the fullest extent possible. And through doing that, or instead of doing that as much as we can, um, to evaluate our design processes in addition to the artifacts we build. So that reflection I just shared with you is, is guided by feminist epistemologies that are really in the business of thinking about experience and affect and emotion um, and how the, the experiences we have in addition to the personal and political and institutional context that we work in are part of that. I, I think this is like 
essential if we're going to challenge the harmful power dynamics that make up the institutions that we work. Academia is absolutely one of them. Um, so there's a lot more that I could say, but I guess um, I could sort of stop here and have the rest be more interactive because um, I'd love to hear your thoughts. And um, thanks so much for your time and for listening. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to stop recording now and then. Uh...